What's up guys, today I'll be sharing with you a gambit against 1d4 that drove me absolutely nuts when I was a teenager. I lost so many games against this Von Hennig Shara gambit with c5, cd5 and cd4 that it just like made me hate chess for a, a period of time. But okay, on a more serious note, this gambit is actually quite a dangerous weapon and in this train we're definitely going to see how to play it. Uh, let's start with a move queen takes d4 because that is the move that you will face most often. Well, the idea of this CD4 gambit is, you know, we have the pin on the pawn to the queen. White will, you know, move his queen away, and, well, we are sacrificing a pawn. But on the other hand, we're also getting very open play for our pieces. And also a nice thing about this gambit is that there's actually quite a few different ways to play it. For example, in the very early days, they were playing bishop e6 and, you know, being happy to trade the queens, but to uh, try to annoy white with knight b4. The computer subsequently kind of showed that this is not really giving black enough compensation. And so, nowadays you'll see the experts this opening actually playing the move queen c7, avoiding the exchange of queens and allowing the knight f6 attack to come with a tempo. So, for example, after knight f3, knight to f6, white most often brings the queen all the way back to d1, because if you play something like queen b3, black just develops with tempo and just gets very fast play. Kind of like we'll see in some of the other lines too where after queen to d1, uh, here you actually have an interesting choice of ways to develop your pieces. The standard one that black will go for most of the time is to move bishop c5, but you could also make an argument for bishop b4, which is the preference of the computer. But I'm going to go with bishop c5 because it's the most thematic, and after e3, uh, you can play castles in this position, and what we're going to see is that even though black maybe doesn't have any immediate threats per se, we do have some very active pieces after the move rook f to d8, uh, which I think I like slightly better than the move rook a d8. You could make an argument for either move. It is true that rook a d8 does score like 3 out of 4 in the lead chess database, which is definitely quite nice for us. But the advantage of rook f d8 is that, let's say, if they play a move like queen b3, for example, well, we can sort of go a6, b5, knight a5, rook c8, and you know the queen will continue to get harassed. And I think our rooks just kind of belong on the open files in general. And really when you've played a gambit this way, you know, you're not really playing it, let's say, to mate the opponent's king. But just getting some nice active piece play for the pawn, very much in the style of the martial gambit of the Royal Lopez. There's a line where you play d5 in the Spanish and you sack the pawn, but get, you know, very good piece play in return. It's very similar to that, but only we're doing it against 1d4. Uh, now, there are other ways why I can play as well. So let's say... For example, if we go back a little bit, um, in this position, if they don't take the pawn with the, you know, with the queen, then you're just doing very well. Like, for example, knight d5, knight f6 is already just giving you a very nice lead in development. Like, takes, takes is already much better for black, because you're already threatening to go bishop b4 and win your pawn back, and it's very easy for you to bring the other piece into the attack as well. So, you don't want to do this if you're white. Also, e3, knight f6 is, again, just a very pleasant IQP position for black, it's kind of like a Tarish defense on steroids after bishop b4 and, and the normal sort of moves from there. I uh, think you get the idea. Now, if white plays the move queen a4, then you know, this is a move that's actually very common on lead chess, but yeah, just ed5 again wins back the pawn and gives you a very nice position where you know, if they let you go d4, then you should generally go for it. It's actually kind of like a... Uh, an Alep and Sicilian line I covered in my Crush sub 1800s with E4 course, but kind of with colors reversed in that sense. Uh, so if they do play something like Queen E4, then you know you have Knight F6 to you know win back the pawn, and if Queen E3, then you've got Knight B4. So this is just to show that you know White can't be too tricky, or he's just going to outsmart himself. Now, what if White decides to play uh, inter intermediate move of Queen to A4 in this position? Um, this can be a little bit tricky for us, because after bishop here, queen takes d4, we see that after takes, takes, that in this position, the extra move bishop d7 is not necessarily in black's best interest, because the pawn here is under attack. Uh, but here's where we can be quite resourceful, and in a game in 2008 City National Open, Alexander Princev, Ukrainian, I am actually played knight f6 against me. The idea being that if white were to take on b7... Uh, queen d1 is going to be my main line, but if they do play queen b7, black actually gets pretty good compensation for the two pawns here. 
like if bishop f4 you go bishop b4 and you know the pin on the knight is actually kind of annoying and makes it a bit difficult for white to fully consolidate you know develop the king side in time uh but if you play queen b3 and move the queen to safety well you're also expending a lot of time moving this queen around this is what the first second third fourth fifth move with the queen so rook b8 you know we just develop very actively and i believe after bishop b4 knight to f3 you know you can just play knight e4 castle bishop dc3 and the fact you've got a big lean development is going to make up for the fact that you are currently down two pawns i know it's just it's harder to go for it when you know the you don't have the engine telling you that black is doing okay but you know you can take my word for it that you know this position after knight d2 is going to be okay for black uh, as such uh you know like castles and you know, the game goes on from here black did win the one game on uh on Lee Chess in practice, so that is one encouraging point here. Well, in the game, well, rather my main line is to play to move queen d1. Uh, if they do play queen b3 here, I quite like the move knight a6, just preparing knight c5 to kick the queen, and you know, maybe you're not getting 100% equality, but you definitely get quite decent piece play with knight c5, rook c8, and your know, ideas of potentially piling up on the c3 knight once again, which is a little bit of a theme that we've seen throughout so far. So that really finally leaves the move queen to d1 in this position, and in the past black was normally playing the move knight to c6, but actually now there's a, another move order you'll see more often in the move of bishop to c5, and basically delaying this move of knight c6, and you might be wondering, well, why exactly we're delaying knight c6, and it's a little bit of an advanced reason, but I'll share it with you just because it will definitely help you to play against this gambit as well when you're playing as white. Um, so if you play knight c6 and then play to move bishop to c5, it turns out that this rare move of a3 is actually very unpleasant for black. And the idea of a3 is basically that white is preparing to play to move bishop to g5 and pin our knight before playing e3. Now, if you played bishop g5 move earlier, queen b6 would be a very annoying fork, right? But here after queen b6, we can play e3. And taking on b2 is actually a blunder, though to be fair, black is already in a bad spot anyway. Because of the move bishop takes f6, followed by the move knight a4, which is actually trapping the queen. You know, if it wasn't for bishop b4, black would lose the queen. But as it stands, black loses the piece, and you know, white would just be winning in this position. As happened in one Lee Chess game between two 2200, 2300-ish players here. So, basically by playing the move order with bishop c5, you know, on the one hand you can't cast along and hack their king... But on the other hand, it means that if they do play, like, let's say, a3 in this position, well, you can go queen c7, and then bishop g5 is not working quite as well in comparison. You know, when you've got the bishop defended on d7, then, you know, this is not going to be as uh, as bad for black. Uh, also, like, after e3, queen b2, you know, we see that, you know, why it's not able to go knight a4, because the bishop's covering it. Um, the engine says why it's still better anyway with knight d5, but... I think it's a sole position that, yeah, most people are going to be reasonably happy to play this as black. You know, you've got the pawn back and the bishop pair gives some compensation for your dodgy pawn structure after king h8 or, or bishop a4. Uh, also, I mean, I guess, yeah, in... Uh, well, yeah, this is basically yeah, the idea from black's point of view. It is true when you are playing these sort of sideline openings, you know, even when your idea works, white does still often get a bit of an edge, and that was the line where we saw that. But more often your opponents will play to move e3, and you know, here we can go queen e7, rook d8, again delaying the move knight c6 just to keep white guessing, uh, after castles and knight to c6. This is really the key position where, you know, objectively speaking, white does have a small advantage in this position, like the queen a4 check line is the main reason I don't see the von heading more often. But in practice, black is scoring nearly 50% in the Lee Chess uh, opening explorer, and actually, yeah, it's actually a fairly similar percentage if we take just two 500 plus level games. Um, so normally white does play a3, and you know, in this case there are obviously many ways black can play, but normally black does go rook a c8. I would opine that you may prefer to play to move knight e5 first, just to go bishop c6, and you, know, you get decent piece play. White probably is a tiny bit better, but you know, after bishop c6 you definitely can line up the bishops for decent attacking chances against the... Uh, the white king here. And if they play something a bit different, like bishop d2, um, once again, knight e5 is still a move, but I would probably just go rook a c8, and 
If they play rook to c1 here, I would again go knight e5, offer a trade to the knights, you know, also clears way for bishop f5 and try and exploit the weakness on d3 if they refuse to take e5. And again, black has reasonable compensation, you know, you're not 100% equalizing these lines, but it's definitely quite decent. Um, if they go queen b3, this is merely a little bit of an annoying move. Also, it would be a little annoying on the previous move as well. I mean, you do have bishop e6 to kick the queen, but, you know, again, I do have to admit the white is probably somewhat better in this position. You know, black is not getting quite full compensation for the pawn in uh, in this instance. Um, like here, you should probably go knight e5, you know, and try to yeah, get some tricks happening like this as such. And, you know, continue harassing the queen is probably also not bad. Um, but yeah, as you can see, this is the gambit that used to drive me really nuts when I was a junior, this von Hennig. Admittedly, if you play queen a4 and sort of play the main line that I showed you with, you know, this system of queen d1 and, you know, knight f3, then, you know, if white plays correctly, he does get an advantage. But I also find that for a practical level, these positions are quite tricky for white to play, especially if it comes as a surprise. So it's definitely a weapon that you could consider adding to your repertoire, you know, at least for some fun blitz and rapid games, despite the, you know, the engine's somewhat pessimistic assessment. I mean, like, if you're a gambiteer, your life is a bit hard as black, because all of the gambits, or nearly all the gambits with the black pieces, do typically, you know, give white an advantage if they play correctly, but, you know, and this does score well for black in the database, and, you know, there's a big chance your opponents will, for example, play a move like queen d4, which is, you know, what you'll see in, like, 46,000 of, you know, 63,000 games in lead chess, and, you know, from that we kind of see that, well, if you have to get most of the games, then you do get a pretty playable position with, you know, the idea I showed you with knight c6, and uh, there's a little queen c7 is a nice way to, to get some reasonable play with black. Probably white's still a little bit better, but it's probably a little bit of a better version than perhaps the version we saw with 5 queen a4. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and you know, I hope you appreciate my honesty about the fact that, you know, white is better if he plays correctly in this line, but it still may not stop you from having good results within blitz where your opponent's may not be so ready and might start to make some silly mistakes, much like I did when I was an 1800 player playing against this and, you know, losing like an idiot every time with white. Um, anyway, that's all for this video. Do make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next training. Take care.